one of the things that's a problem when I talk publicly and I do interviews and I'm talking about ibotenic acid is people write and say, you're crazy, it's neurotoxic. So I've addressed that. I've addressed that a lot, but they don't come watch my videos. So in case you come watch my videos or in case you've seen comments under videos or wherever I've spoken about ibotenic acid, I want to teach you this. The first problem is that even Wikipedia, when you go to places like Wikipedia and you want to read about ibotenic acid, it will say maybe somewhere in the beginning that it's a powerful lesioning agent when injected into the brains of rats. Then it will go on to explain to you its, its effects on the brain pharmacologically, the metabolism of it and all this stuff. And the problem is that when you read that, when most people read that, they see the beginning where it says injected into the rats of brain, brains of rats. But then they, you go on to read all that and, and something in your brain makes you think, oh, this is when I take the mushroom. And there's that huge leap between injecting it directly into the brain and using it orally. A lot of processes happen when you ingest something orally. You've got the mastication and the breaking down of it. You've got the breakdown of the sugars in the mouth. And then you've got everything that happens in the gut. And everything that you eat is broken down differently by different proteins and acids in the gut. And then different things are absorbed differently through the gut. A lot happens to process something before it leaves the gut. And then if it's considered a toxin, it can go through the toxic pathways of the body to get broken down into substances that are not toxic. Then when it's in the bloodstream, it is heavily controlled about where it's allowed to go in the body. And then we have a blood brain barrier and it is part of the study of things to determine what will cross it and what won't. And even that is highly controlled. So by the time you get something to the brain that you have ingested, it has had to go through a lot of gates to make it there. That's issue number one. Issue number two, in all of these studies that you're reading about on Wikipedia, they're talking about lab created, synthetic, isolated, pure ibotenic acid. That is a completely different thing than ibotenic acid that is in a whole mushroom. And here's why. We have a serious problem with Western medicine and Western science. And that is that they have been obsessed with isolating a single substance from the natural world and then deciding what is the action of this thing all by itself. When there is literally no proof anywhere that any one chemical in the natural world works all by itself, anywhere in the natural world, in the ground, in a tree, in the dirt, when we consume it. Everything works with associated compounds that are usually found on board that same packaging in that same plant in that same food. They work together to cause a series of processes that turn out to be either toxic or healthy or whatever for us. And in the early days of vitamins, they would synthesize vitamins and use just this one vitamin, make synthetic versions of it or whatever. And since then we've learned, you know, like vitamin C needs bioflavonoids to be bioavailable to the body. And that turns out to be in the packaging. So it's better to eat the fruit or whatever. I don't understand this obsession by Western science to continue to isolate a substance and then synthetically create it so that you can patent it, so that you can sell it, so that you can say it does this thing. And we have seen repeatedly in medicine that when they take something from its natural version and then isolate it and then make it synthetically and then patent it and then put it in a pill and then give it to people that it can be destructive. That happens over and over and over and over. And yet we continue to do it. Why? Why are we not looking at all of the other things that came on board in that packaging 
and how all of that could be working together to create the positive effects that you see. So again, number one, there are no oral ingestion studies of ibotenic acid, none. And so everything that you read about ibotenic acid is from being injected into the brain. And then when you read that in Wikipedia about all the things it does in the glutamate channels and then causes the calcium things and this and that and how it kills brain cells, people are thinking, oh my God, if I eat this mushroom, this is what's gonna happen to me. And I wanted you to understand that is from number one, synthetic isolated ibotenic acid with no other things around it. Number two, injected into the brain. Number three, in unbelievably high quantities. So I want you to understand that whatever you're reading about the pharmacological actions of ibotenic acid, that is not this mushroom. It's a lab created synthetic version injected into the brain and this is what it does, right? So now I want to teach you what we do know about the brain and neurons and learning. And then I'm gonna go off into my own hypotheses about this mushroom and talk about the entourage effect. And the entourage effect is when there are other associated compounds that work synergistically together to create an outcome. So they are like the entourage that work together. And so what we do understand about the brain, and this is any, any impulse that happens in your entire nervous system. So you know it's an electrical impulse. And by electrical, we mean positive and negative, just like in the wall, electricity moves by moving positive and negative charges. And in the neurons, that's managed by calcium ions. They, they have a positive charge and they'll go into the cell and make the cell more positive. And then they'll come back out of the cell and make the cell negative again. And it, it's chemistry. If you understand chemistry, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible, but that's how you send a nerve signal down the line. When you get to the synapse, that spot between them, a lot of things happen to control all of the chemicals that are going from one neuron to the next neuron and on down the line. And whether they're going to be sent around to the outside of it and down the myelin sheath and to help build it, what's going to happen in that synapse to sort of take up anything that's going to be crossing it. And there are literally hundreds of things that work there how much of that's going to cross and go on to the next one, that kind of thing. So when calcium works its way down the line and into that synapse, calcium can get pushed onto the next one or it can be taken up. And that is a method of control. And what we believe is that neurons that are just sitting there and they're not really performing any function, they have a very low set point of the amount of calcium that's allowed into that cell and to cross that synapse and then to go on to the next cell. But in the case of learning, let's say you're, that neuron is now gonna be responsible for learning a particular thing, either something to fear in your environment, a new traumatic memory, a happy occasion, like the birth of a child or something, and that memory is gonna be stored there, or a fact you've got to learn for your job, whatever memory, whatever that neuron is gonna be responsible for learning is that calcium is increased for that cell and it continues to flood that cell repeatedly, but it's highly controlled. And then when it leaves, something has happened to that cell now that it's changed and it's different. And now it has that information. What they have found, and the same is true for MSG and anything that works through the glutamate pathways, you, you hear glutamate, right? Monosodium glutamate, MSG. Well, ibotenic acid works along the same pathways as, MS, as glutamate, through the glutamate channels and glutamate pathways. And what glutamate does is glutamate is like the key that opens the door to let the calcium in and then closes it. So glutamate is sort of used to meter that. Well, if you flood the brain with a lot of glutamate, it's going to hold the door open and you're just going to get this constant movement of calcium, right? And when you inject ibotenic acid directly into the brain, you flood the glutamate and the glutamate opens all the doors and calcium floods the cells until they die. They basically explode. Okay, that's not cool. That's not good, especially in a system that is being so carefully controlled.
I mean, we're talking about the difference between just a regular cell functioning and then a cell learning. And then way up here where you've injected an ibotenic acid to cause just this flood of calcium. So what I am theorizing is that one of the entourage items is a metal vanadium and that vanadium is going to work with, and I'm going to explain it to you here in just a moment to help meter the amount of ibotenic acid that's leaving one neuron and going into that synapse space that can be allowed to go to the next one. And then if you can carefully control the amount of glutamate, then you're gonna carefully control the amount of calcium. And I am theorizing that ibotenic acid in huge amounts injected into the brain, of course it, it's toxic, of course it's, it will kill that brain cell. But that's not how we live. We live within a living system. We are a living system. We're eating living fruits and, and vegetables and plants that have all these associated things that control and gate where they go in our bodies and how they function and that it's complex and that ibotenic acid is used to come in and help heal by helping to actually help that neuron learn. So let's say that it is holding a negative memory. This is me totally hypothesizing, but I'm gonna back it up with something in just a second. Let's say it holds a negative memory, a painful memory, a memory that causes you panic or anxiety, that it will go in and that the ibotenic acid opens those channels, it works on the glutamate to open the channel, let more calcium in, and that calcium goes in and alters the structure of the memory in that particular neuron to fix it and make it right. That is how it is a balancer of these systems and how it is an adaptogen. And then it, when it has permanently altered that cell, it leaves. And we're talking about the difference between here and here, right? And not all the way up here. And that it can do this because there are other things we don't even know about yet. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because we understand that when you use entheogens, I believe the study was done with psilocybin, and I'll try to find it and put it in the description of this video, where there was an MRI, and they, they did an MRI, and they asked somebody to talk about negative painful memories. I think it was a lot, more than one person. Oh, I'm so bad with numbers, too. In the 20, 20, 23, 25 people, they asked them to talk about a painful memory. Then they took mushrooms, they took psilocybin, and they asked them to talk about that painful memory again. And that part of the brain was just lighting up. Then a week later, I think a week, oh, I need to find the study. They asked them to talk about that memory again. And that part of the brain had shrunk dramatically. So we know that entheogens are doing something in the neurons to our painful memories, to that part of the brain. And they, had, it, they said they theorized that it looked like they had culled a lot of those connections so that you could form the whole memory. Like each piece of the memory is put together like a puzzle through a lot of your neurons, that a lot of those were cut. And then a lot of people say, I'm sorry, I keep saying a lot. I, it's so unprofessional, but I don't have a different word right now. People say, I forgave them. I understood why they did it. It's not connected to pain for me anymore. When I think about it, it's just a pretty simple memory of, yes, that happened. And then I move on. So perhaps it's cutting off where all the pain was held and that now less calcium is available to that cell. And now that cell is withering in its structural hold of that memory. And that because it's not getting any more calcium, those memories are fading and breaking apart and it is no longer held as pain and that it's been rerouted around those painful cells to create a new memory that was created that is a forgiving memory. And ah, I get why they did it. I understand. And then routed to the part of the brain that deals with emotions where forgiveness and love are held, right? So there's the calling of bad memories, bad neurons and new ones. This is me just creating hypotheses. So I know that, I know that I'm making shit up at this point, but I'm asking you to just follow my logic. So do you understand the problem we have with the science and the problems that we have with these ibotenic acid things that you're reading 
most people are assuming that's when you eat the mushroom and nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about vanadium and some stuff that, that for any of you that want to stick around about some more details about the glutamate pathways and the synapses and metals and acetyl derivatives. So there is a video that I'm going to link to here where this guy is talking about um, in acetyl cysteine and its role in the mediation of glutamate uptake in the synapses in the brain, right? And ibotenic acid goes through those same pathways. So when you look at Kevin Feeney's book, The Fly Agaric Compendium, Eva Machacek has a chapter in there on the constituents of this mushroom. And when you know it, this mushroom has in acetyl cysteine, the very thing that works in the mediation of the glutamate pathways in our brains. Why is that there, right? So she says that um, most of them are in the forms of ceramides and cerebrocytes, but she doesn't go into much more detail. And I don't know if we have any more detail than that, but what if those are responsible for the mediation of ibotenic acid in the synapses in our brains? And then since they're fats, they may also be coming across in the fat extracts that I make and that I got from ancient use. And that may be also helping to not only get it transdermally into the body, but then mediating it into the synapses in the peripheral synapses of peripheral nervous systems. And then we know that metals will cause that conversion of some of these lipid compounds and they use in different metals will convert different in acetyl derivatives. So things like copper and palladium and titanium and rhodium. Well, we know that this mushroom takes up vanadium. It turns it into a form that can be used by our body that's actually good for us. Maybe what if this is what they're doing with that? It's one of the things, one of the things that they're doing with that vanadium is that when we get that into our bodies, then it is helping these derivatives, these ceramides and the cerebrosides to help mediate the uptake in the synapses of our brains and in that way is helping to make it neuroprotective. There is a lot to say about ibotenic acid. So please do some research into this. And this is now time stamped as being uploaded to YouTube so that you know when I'm saying this, I want science to do research on this. It is my opinion and totally my opinion, all of this hypothesis here, but also it is my opinion it's neuroprotective and that it is safe to use not every single day I talk about that. I talk about microdosing and leaving some of the ibotenic acid in there. So educate yourself on what I say. Educate yourself on this. Let's have discussions about it and let's call for more science. And most definitely we need oral ingestion studies to find out the truth about the potentials of ibotenic acid on either side, good or bad. Got it? Cool.